Welcome back to this series. This is the last part of this series. It's time to finish it up and also fix a bug. The bug I want to fix is pretty hard to reproduce, unfortunately. I failed to reproduce it, but we saw it in the last part of this series. And that bug was related to the, the bookings here and the events we're retrieving for the bookings. And that the events we retrieved here actually didn't match the events we booked. Now the problem stems here from this events function here in the merge.js file. In here, we're getting that array of IDs and we're then fetching these events in our database and we're returning the events uh, mapped with transform event, which takes care about um, merging that with other data. But in the end, we return our events here. Now, the thing that can cause issues here is that MongoDB does not guarantee the order in which it returns the result unless you sort um, with uh, the help of the sort method here. The problem is that event loader or data loader, which we use here, in the end, of course, gives us that array of events and of, of event IDs. And therefore, when we return our events, the order has to match the order of IDs here because that is used by data loader to match the events we return. So we have to guarantee that we return the events here in the order of their IDs in that event IDs array we're getting as an input. Now, achieving that is not that difficult. We can use uh, events here, so this events constant. We can call sort on that, which is a default JavaScript method. And uh, we can sort here um, by using that function, which we have to pass as an argument, where we get two elements in that events array, which we have to compare. And we have to return minus one and one here to define the order of elements. And that's the default sort JavaScript function, nothing special here. What I will return here is in the end, just um, the difference between event IDs index of, now I'm referring to that array of event IDs, which I'm getting, index of A, and there underscore ID to string, because A is an event object as retrieved um, by Mongoose from MongoDB. There we have that underscore ID uh, property, which is this object ID thing. And with two string, we get a string. And now I'm searching for that ID in the event IDs array to find its position there with the help of index of. And then I find out, well, what is the position? Let's say that is index one. And I deduct the position of B, basically. So in event IDs, I then search with index of B dot underscore ID to string. So sort executes this function here on every element in this events array. And we then have to return minus one or one, as I mentioned, uh, or basically a negative or a positive number, which defines uh, whether um, this element we're looking at uh, goes uh, in front of the other one. So we're comparing these two pairs and that decides which uh, element comes first. And that is executed for all elements in the events array. And by looking for the IDs of both A and B in event IDs, I find the position there and I find the order there. And this is my way of ordering the events array based on the event IDs array. This will then sort the events array and it will uh, ensure that we actually do return our sorted events here, um, sorted by ID, which is um, not alphabetical, but really sorted by ID as it's sorted in this event IDs array we're getting. Therefore, we are returning elements in the order we're getting them here, which helps event loader uh, connect elements. To showcase this, let's add a console log here and let's output events and event IDs here. And save that. And uh, I got two types of events here. Um, Dinner in the Dark is not there, but the other events are there. And now if I go to bookings, I get an error. Let's have a look. Events IDs is not defined. Yeah, I clearly have a typo somewhere. Yeah, that should not be events IDs, but event IDs as it's named here. So let's now wait for this. Go to events and go back here. And now here are the events. And if we go back, here's our console log. What we can see is we got, this is the event IDs array, and we see the ID with uh, free at the end comes first here. That is how event loader basically ordered that or gave it to us. And if we have a look at the retrieved events here, we also see it there. 
This is the event with the ID with the free at the end and it comes first here as well. And by this, uh, by using this logic, we ensure that event loader can match our data correctly or that data loader, that's the name of the package, can match our events correctly. And therefore this bug should be avoided. Now that is it with this application. Obviously you can always add more. We could add persistent authentication so that we don't have to log in again whenever this page reloads. We could store that token in local storage, add an expiry time, even add a refresh token and so much more. You can work on the user interface. Uh, with data loader, you could uh, set up caching per request instead of the caching we currently have, which is basically per server lifetime, which is not necessarily optimal. These are all things you can definitely do. But this series is already huge. It's far bigger than I wanted it to be and it was a lot of fun creating it. I hope you also got a lot out of it. Definitely share your feedback, your ideas, and maybe we'll do a part two. Maybe we'll add more to this in the future. For now, this is the current state of this series. And I hope you learned a lot about GraphQL, how it works, how you create a GraphQL API, how you define a schema there, how resolvers work, how you can optimize them with tools like Data Loader and why that might be required. And you also learned a lot about React, hopefully, how we build a user interface, which now finally at the end doesn't look that bad, um, how we connect that to the GraphQL API and how we did all that without the help of any third party library. Now that's another thing, of course. There is Apollo. Apollo is a huge library that can help us with creating both a GraphQL server, so the backend, as well as use it on the front end for efficient requests and caching of API responses on the front end. You can definitely do that too. You can use that and you will probably use that in bigger applications. But my goal with this series also was to have a look behind the scenes and teach you everything from the ground up. Because what I personally found is that GraphQL can be can look easy when you see it the first time and then it quickly looks intimidating. And I hope that this series kind of helps you understand what's happening behind the scenes so that now you can of course also use tools like Apollo and so on that abstract some complexity away, but you know what's going on behind the scenes. So enough of the talking. Please share your feedback, share your thoughts, your future wishes. Uh, we'll certainly do project series again, maybe building up on this one or maybe building a new one, maybe then using more advanced tools, Apollo and so on. We'll see. I hope you liked it and I hope I see you back in our videos. Bye.